Okay, I guess we'll um, get started now. Um, so I'm uh, Matt Trinish. I'm the QA PTL. I work for um, HP on making uh, OpenStack better for basically everyone. And I'm Andrea Frittoli. I'm on, on the QA team uh, for OpenStack as well, and I work for HP. I'm responsible for uh, QA for our Helium OpenStack distribution. And uh, we're going to be talking today about um, the external plugin interfaces we have in many of the OpenStack QA projects. Um, so we'll just get into it. Yeah, so we are from the OpenStack QA team. So just quoting our mission statement, uh, what is our team about? Um, we care about OpenStack quality, stability throughout the cycle at any point during the cycle. So we work and uh, develop uh, new tools or maintain existing tools that are uh, used for that basically so that uh, the entire ecosystem can ensure quality throughout the cycle. Um, we have a, yeah, a number of different uh, projects that uh, we care about. Um, a few of them they are uh, related to uh, syntax uh, check tools like Bash 8 or uh, hacking or Slint the con config as uh, yeah, OpenStack. Yeah, for JavaScript. It's relatively new. <laughs> yeah, it's brand new. Um, we have tools for setting up um, the test environment, deploying your cloud, like the DevStack or the DevStack Vagrant for the two node uh, is relatively new as well. Um, we have actual testing tools and frameworks, like the Tempest. Tempest Leave is a library for building your own test. Grenade for upgrade testing. And finally, we have tools that are um, focusing on the analysis, post-processing, uh, and visualization of the test results. Uh, such as StackVit, uh, OS Teststar, and the uh, new OpenStack Health dashboard that we have. Um, so before we go into what the plugins are and how they work, how we use them, I th thought it would be good to explain some of the rationale behind why we decided to go to a more modular um, approach for a lot of our QA projects. And to really talk about that, we have to talk about um, what QA was probably two years ago, a year ago even, um, and that our scope would be we would directly support all incubated and integrated OpenStack projects. Um, and this worked great uh, for five projects. Um, when we got to 10, we started to see, you know, some of the um, things starting to get stretched thinly. Um, so just to show the number of OpenStack projects over time, this shows, you know, releases, um, and which projects were incubated, integrated, or existed, and were neither. Um, and QA as a thing was, you know, starting around Essex and was formalized during uh, Grizzly, I think. Um, or maybe it was Havana, but whatever. Um, but you can see that, you know, we started with a small group and then things started to grow really quickly, really fast, and the number of projects we had to directly support in Tree, you know, it was anything that was green or blue. Um, and at Ice House, that's quite a lot. <laughs> and it's a relatively small team. And we started seeing, you know, we couldn't keep up with the pace of things coming in. We, it was too difficult as, a, as an open source project to basically have a traditional QA approach where, the, you know, the QA team is dictating the final steps for every project. It's something that just doesn't scale in an open source community like OpenStack. Um, Another way to illustrate this, I find, is um, looking at Tempest tests over time. This is a really um, ugly diagram that I put together. But it's just showing you the trend that, you know, there are some projects that have a lot of tests. And then at the bottom, there are a ton that have, like, nothing. Um, and that's, I find that's a good way to illustrate, um, you know, how we fail to scale um, after a certain point of doing everything by ourselves in one repo. Um, and eagle-eyed people will notice that Grizzly is missing. That's because it was impossible to run. <laughs> um, so, and then the next thing that happened was the big tent. <laughs> and our previous scope completely went out the window, and the amount of projects that came in uh, grew very rapidly. I think we've added about a dozen in one cycle. Um, and, you know, we couldn't scale at what we had before, and opening the floodgates to everyone just didn't work. So we had to come up with um, a new approach to doing the QA project in the open source community. And 
what we decided to do was QA will still support that direct base, those you know, five core projects, because that's what most of these OpenStack projects depend on, you know, having that core infrastructure as a service with Nova, Keystone, Glance. And um, if we, it's very important to ensure that that works, because nothing else in this large ecosystem under that flaming tent um, will work unless that core layer is there. Um, but to support those other projects, to let them control their own destiny and do what they want and ensure that they have you know, the right level of quality they're looking for, we provide stable plugin interfaces where it makes sense so that they can expand the core tooling that we're using on that base layer to include anything else in the wider ecosystem that we want. Um, and we found that this fits the growth pattern in OpenStack because it's exponential. There's no, I don't think there's another trend that fits it. Um, it's, the, it's a much better fit, and it's also a better fit for the open source philosophy, where people can do what they need to do. There's, you know, it's freedom. People have the ability to use these plugin interfaces if they want to, but they don't have to. And we just, we, we're upfront and honest about whether they're using them or not. And that, that's really how we ended up getting to these plugin interfaces. Um, for today, the current definition of that core set from the QA team perspective is Keystone, Nova, Glance, Cinder, Neutron, and Swift. These are the projects that we eventually want to be the only ones that are in tree direct support. So in Tempest, the only tests in the Tempest tree will be for these projects. For DevStack, the only things in the DevStack tree will be for these projects. Any other projects that fall outside of this will be in a plugin, and we advertise the plugins and make it as easy to run the plugins. Um, and so that's a little bit about you know where we were and how we got to where we are today. And granted, this is still new, so we still have things in tree that we need to decompose into plug plugins still. Yeah. Um, that being said, um, I thought it, we should uh, dig into going over different plugins. So, Andrew. Yeah. So. There are um, three different projects that we support, like plugins uh, framework. Um, the first one is DevStack. Um, so DevStack plugins actually serve kind of three different functions, so there are three different types, if you will. Um, one is um, I have my project. Um, it's not one of the core six, and I want it to actually be deployed in DevStack as part of the cloud that I'm uh, deploying there for testing. Um, and uh, with the plugin, I can hook my project into the deployment process. The other one is actually using different configuration in DevStack or in one of the existing services, like a custom uh, driver, like a different hypervisor in Nova or a different uh, Cinder backend or so forth. Or some networking dude. Or some, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, there are quite a few of those. And uh, there is a third use case um, that is uh, deploying some service which relies on the cloud that was deployed by uh, DevStack, so something that runs on top of the cloud. Uh, one example for which we have a plugin is NodePool. Um, so NodePool is a system which, uh, a tool which is used by OpenStack Infra um, to uh, allocate test node from a cloud. So uh, to have a development environment for NodePool, um, you need to uh, run uh, NodePool and connect it to some cloud. So that with a DevStack plugin, you can set up a DevStack with a running cloud and a NodePool uh, instance that is configured to work with the cloud that was deployed there. Um, so what the, what's the plugin, in fact? It's, um, so it's several bits of bash code, in fact, uh, that is, um, living outside of the dev stack tree. So it's maintained in a different project uh, by the team um, responsible for, for, for it. It's called by dev stack via strong contract. Um, and yeah, so there is a registry of plugins which is maintained by the community. It's actually not uh, so up to date. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's kind uh, of stale. Right. Um, so, and um, yeah, so you can see in the, in the registry there are probably been 20 plugins or so, but this graph shows that what the actual plugins implemented since the beginning of the year until now. So we have uh, quite kind of linear it's growth. It's basically linear except for at Summit. Yeah, yeah. exactly. We were looking at it. It was like, oh, what's that? Oh, hmm, looks like Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so we have 57 different plugins 
uh, right now, which is quite impressive. Uh, yeah, I think quite impressive growth. Um, so if you want to write your own plugin, how do you go about it? So there is a cookie cutter project you can use to set up your basic template and files. So you don't have to use it, but I think it's quite useful. So makes I would recommend easier. it and it makes makes it easier also for people looking at the code. They, they find things in the place they expect to be and so forth. And there are two main areas um, that are uh, uh, that make the plugin. One is a settings file where the global variables are defined. Um, this is a file which is sourced pretty early in the stack uh, process. So if you want to uh, impact the way um, the variables that are used in the set dev stack process before your code is actually executed, you can set variables there and affect uh, the behavior in there. And the other part is the plugin file, um, plugin.sh. And there you implement the, the hooks for the different phases of the stack uh, process, and as well as unstack and clean. If you use the cookie cutter, um, it actually creates uh, a file for you in a lib folder where you have a, a template for all the functions that you need to implement to get your plugin done, apart from the settings. So you have the, the pre-install, install, and co configure and init are the four phases that are uh, where you can intervene during the stack process. So you can have uh, installation of OS level packages. Uh, you can have installation of your um, service if it, if it is uh, an OpenStack service that you're installing, um, configuration, and uh, the init uh, or extra is um, like a setting. If it's an OpenStack project that relies on a database, typically you do things like um, yeah, setting up the scheme of your database yeah, or, or you know Keystone. Keystone. You have to do that admin token song and dance to that kind of thing, right? And start your service. Shutdown is for shutting down when you do the unstack and clean up for removing doing. everything. Yeah, <laughs> uninstalling stuff and everything. So the second uh, project where we um, implemented plugins is Tempest. Um, Tempest plugin allow you to run, um, discover and run a set of tests that are maintained outside of the Tempest tree. Um, and they allow you to combine the configuration option you get in Tempest uh, originally from the core Tempest and uh, configuration options that you may need for your plugin and have access to both of them in uh, your test code. Uh, we use Steve Dor, their extension manager um, for discovery. So you need, uh, you just need to install uh, your plugin and then install Tempest and Tempest will discover your plugin. Um, and the test code that you uh, write should be built on top of test Tempest Lib. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't but it, it helps yeah. make things a lot easier if it's using the same testing framework underneath. Indeed, yeah. This is uh, where we are in terms of um, Tempest plugins. Uh, so Manila opened the way and was the Tempest uh, plugin for Manila was developed, it was the first one to be developed. It was developed. the first one, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and then we had three more ones, uh, yeah. three more that were developed in the meantime. So Sahara Congress and Monaska one. Um, it doesn't look like DevStack yet, but yeah, it was it's not <laughs> nearly as impressive as the DevStack graph. <laughs> Much uh, it's more newer. So, and um, if you want to write your own Tempest plugin and make that graph look nicer in the <laughs> next <laughs> cycle, um, so there is a cookie cutter. Again, it's it's nice to, to use it because you get all the folders and you don't have to, but I uh, recommend using it. You can, um, again, host your uh, plugin code within the uh, tree of your project if you want. You can have a dedicated repository, uh, but you don't need to do that. I mean, you can I do either. Um, so how do you write your plugin? So you have to um, extend the Tempest plugin class from Tempest, which, yeah, it lives in Tempest at the moment. In, we might move it to Tempest Leap in future, probably. Probably, because so it's a stable interface, and that's what yeah, Tempest lives exactly. for. So when you go and implement your plugin, just check if it is moved to Tempest Leap. Well, it will, we'll have a backwards compatibility shim if we ever do move it um, yeah. to ensure that it works for legacy plugins, but it's... It was just done in Tempest for um, because we were evolving it organically, and that's what the Tempest we do that, and Tempest Lib is more for stable interfaces. Exactly. And then um, you have to implement the abstract methods for config option discovery and test discovery. 
Um, if you do base your code on Tempest Leap, um, you might find that um, if not everything that you need is in Tempest Leap yet, um, well, feel free to contribute file a bug and help us migrate the things that you um, need from Tempest into Tempest Leap and make them stable interface because that's what we're working on. But I mean, if it's you a see lot of, yeah, it's a lot of work to stabilize the interfaces we have in Tempest because a lot of things weren't written assuming external consumption. Um, so it takes some effort, um, and there are still gaps to write a good external test suite um, using Tempest Lib, and we need to fill those. So if you're writing a plugin and you find gaps, you file a bug, push a commit, help us out with the migration. Right, of course, set up CI for it. I mean, you run your tests and to keep the... So this is how the, how the Tempest plugin class looks uh, like. Um, in Tempest, so there is a load test method that you need to implement, which is used uh, to, it's used by the plugin mechanism to uh, discover uh, the test. So when Tempest actually runs the test uh, discovery phase, uh, it uses the information, the path that you provide via this, uh, via this method to uh, go and discover the test that you provided in your plugin. And there are two more methods, the register options that is uh, invoked when uh, Tempest uh, is setting up its own uh, config uh, mm -hmm. to make it available to test. So it will uh, register the extra options that are defined by, by your plugin and make them available to the tests. Um, and the get opt list, um, this is used when the Tempest conf uh, is generated. So uh, the Tempest, uh, the mechanism that generates the, the Tempest uh, configuration file on the fly, uh, it requires a list of the option available. So if you like install Tempest and do a Tempest in it, in a folder to get your uh, sample, config. sample config there with some config preceded, um, you need to implement this so that it will contain all the options that you need for your plugin configuration. Um, and then the last project that we have a uh, plugin interface implemented on is Grenade. Um, Grenade is the upgrade test suite, which, um, for those who don't know, takes a stable branch of DevStack, deploys a cloud with it, then shuts down that DevStack after running tests on it and creating some resources, and mi migrates to a newer version of all the projects that it just deployed and starts them up using the old configuration files and checks that everything worked. Um, so we have Grenade plugins to enable running upgrades on projects that aren't in the Grenade tree. Um, it also enables adding additional services to the old dev stack. It gives you a phase where you can call plugins um, to add them to the old dev stack. Um, and it also allows you to plug the resource creation phase. There's a phase after dev stack old is deployed that creates resources that are supposed to survive the migration. We use that to create a couple of servers, a cinder volume, images. So we ensure that upgrading your cloud doesn't nuke all of your running instances, because that's kind of important. Um, this is even less impressive of a graph. <laughs> We've only got three plugins right now for Grenade. Um, Grenade is one of those projects that a lot of people don't really know what it does, doesn't, don't really know how it works, so it's, and it only applies to services because it's, those are the things we try, we do the upgrade testing for. Um, and so right now it's Heat, Salamander, and Sahara, which were actually things that were missing grenade tests completely um, because those teams, we, couldn't, we didn't have the review bandwidth. There are three reviewers for grenade. Um, there used to be four, now there are three. Um, and we didn't have the bandwidth to review every project's upgrade procedure, and they also, these projects also didn't have interest in contributing, so now they can control their own upgrade story, which is you know, really useful. Um, the process for writing a Grenade plugin is a bit more involved than the other ones because there's a lot of different stages that go on. Um, and I just realized I put this in a bad order, but uh, let's start with settings, which is in the middle. Um, so settings is used to register any DevStack plugins that you want to deploy on the old side when you first spin up the cloud. So um, the typical way this works for the other projects, Solometer has a DevStack plugin. They call that DevStack plugin to deploy Solometer on the old side. And settings just calls the, sets the local RC file um, option to use that plugin. 
then you also have to register the service to be upgrade tested, which tells Grenade to call the hooks in the other scripts that are listed here. Um, so upgrade.sh um, is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's used to do the migration of the code repos that are, were deployed on old and also rerun uh, SQL database migrations or any other mandatory steps for every migration across every release. Um, shutdown.sh does exactly what it sounds like. You write the bash code to shut down the service you've deployed. Because you can't upgrade unless you shut it down. We don't. Uh, <laughs> different story. Um, Resources.sh um, has the hooks to do the create resource, the check resource, and the teardown resource, which is the resources phase that I described a little while ago, where you um, it will create a resource after old is deployed. Then in the middle of the upgrade, it will do check resource, and then it will check again after the upgrade to ensure that during each stage of the upgrade, you're not losing, losing your VMs, losing your alarms, or whatever plug-in resources your service creates to ensure that it works. And then at the end, you want to make sure you don't leave anything dangling, so it deletes them. And there are hooks in all of these. Um, and then the last thing um, is a little weird. Um, there are certain cases that should be rare. They actually kind of are, which is good, um, where you need to do a manual step for a migration. If there's a backwards incompatible change in a configuration file or a policy file or something with the way the service is deployed, and you have to do an extra step as part of, a, as part of an upgrade. Um, there is a provision in Grenade plugins to call that. You create a directory that's from release, so from Kilo, from Icehouse, um, and you put your script in there, and that will be called as part of the upgrade when you're upgrading from one branch to the next. Um, in, as part of Grenade entry, we're very strict about allowing that. Um, you're never supposed to do that. It's a very severe exception uh, because the theory of upgrade we have in OpenStack is that you can use the old configuration and all you need to do is copy the new code in and run the database schema migrations to ensure your database is up to date or whatever data store your random project is using. Um, so anything besides that is you know, not a good experience for operators and we don't want to um, make that common practice. Um, so when you write a plugin for Grenade, you have to, you should never do this unless, you know, you're very careful about documenting it because it's not good for our users. Um, and with that, we have where to get some more information about things. Um, so there's Tempest official documentation that's up on docs.openstack.org. DevStack has a similar plugin doc. Grenade has a similar plugin doc. I just realized when I created these, I did one, them all plural except for Tempest, um, which I don't know why I did that. <laughs> um, and then you can also reach out to the mailing list to ask questions or if you have specific issues that you have around these plugin interfaces. And also OpenStack QA channel on Freenode, always willing to help people with plugin, writing plugins, questions about plugins, or anything else related to OpenStack QA. Um, and with that, we're going to go to questions. We left uh, a lot of time for questions, I think. Yeah, so, um, uh, there's a mic here. Uh, I'll just It's on, so just pass it to him, please. Thanks. Uh, could you talk about um, the dev stack gate and how does the plugin architecture uh, enhances or changes the configuration that we need to make in the OpenStack infras, the Jenkins okay. jobs on the dev, okay. dev stack. Okay, so um, to do that in, you actually don't have to do anything in dev stack gate. Um, in your job definition in Jenkins job builder, there is a option, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, but it lets you pass through variables to your local RC when dev stack is run eventually as part yeah. of dev stack gate. You say enable plugin and your Git repo for the plugin. And that's it. It's a Jenkins job builder change. So as part of you know, the self-service model and letting people do what they need to do to ensure quality of every project, it's, it's self-contained when you add the job. 
when you push the change to project config to add a job that uses your plugin, you just add this one line to it and your plugin will just work. And there are plenty of examples everywhere for it because there's 57 plugins. <laughs> are there um, any other questions? Uh, there's one back there. If you can just pass the mic, that'll. Uh, so I have two questions. One is uh, any uh, test that uses the Tempest plugin as a base class is good to go as a Tempest plugin, right? It will be discovered and... Yeah, it, uh, the Tempest plugin interface is just for um, anything external. It doesn't actually have to be a Tempest test. It's anything that complies to the Python unit test spec. Okay. Um, it will be loaded as part of Tempest, and then configuration will also be loaded as part of Tempest. So when you run Tempest and you have the Tempest plugin installed, it will be seamless, except you'll see instead of Tempest dot something being run, it'll be Tempest plugin name dot whatever. Okay, so uh, one example, uh, if we talk about the Trove project, uh, if there's Tempest tests uh, for Trove project and uh, they would go in the Trove repository as plugins. Uh, for it can go in the Trove repository or it can go into a separate repository for Trove Tempest okay. tests. There okay. are actually uh, a lot of advantages to doing that um, by decoupling the tests with the code that enables um, testing the API across releases much more easily. Um, mm -hmm. We do that in Tempest in tree, uh, it's called branchless Tempest, that's what we call it, and that enables us to ensure API consistency between releases. If you include the tests in your code, you have to make sure that you always check out master even on stable branches if you're testing interoperability between releases. So there are advantages to doing it in its own repo. There's also install time benefits. You can have separate requirements and things like that because it's all Python install. But you don't have to do it in a separate repo. You can. Right. Oh, yeah. Thanks. No problem. Um, are there any other questions? There's one right there. Just pass the mic to him. Uh, configuration. So if we're adding a bunch of tests as a plugin that have um, extra con configuration values that are outside of what Tempest has, is that part of the plugin architecture? Yes. Um, normalize the configurations? So, I might have just missed it. If I did, um, I apologize. So there are these two options. Um, so register ops gives you a Oslo config object and you have whatever code you want elsewhere and you just in this method you make sure you register the ops on that object. That makes sense. So you just extend it with whatever your own configuration yeah. is. That makes uh, sense. And then get ops list is for the Oslo sample config generator. Um, it expects a tuple, uh, a list of tuples with the group name and the object list or the, the you know the group the object options and you that gets returned, and then when you call the sample config generator, either, either independently or as part of Tempest in it, that'll include all of your extra options. Awesome. And, and this can, works with yeah. arbitrary number of plugins too. So it, right. Yeah. And you can have your dedicated group of options, so you can uh, reach existing groups, like if you want to add to the service available, say your service. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the back. If you can. Uh, I can probably say it I think it's for the video. Um, so, so I'm just curious uh, what was or is the use case for um, um, the per police manual steps uh, since they're highly discouraged, uh, but they're still there for people to use? Um, there are rare exceptions when there is a backwards incompatible change that has to be done. Um, I don't remember any examples off the top of my head, but the procedure we use um, for doing it, I, I think there have been some keystone examples in the past uh, related to like how they do some initial uh, configuration stuff, for example. But um, the rule we use for the grenade in tree is that you have to have PTL sign off from the project and you have to have it mentioned in the release notes already. Because it's, you know, it's not friendly to operators to expand on just updating the database schema on the code. Yeah, thank you. Right. Just because you have a, you have a user release valve doesn't mean you don't want one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, there's uh, one right here, if you can just pass it forward to him. So I remember that uh, some times ago we had a conversation about um, keeping only in the Tempest tree scenario like tests. And now you mentioned the Cisco projects that we continue to live in, uh, in the Tempest tree. My question is if I'd like to you know, push a brand new test that is only 
uh, probing one project? Is it better to put it in, in one of the core projects, I mean? Is it better to push it in Tempest or to push it as a functional test in the project itself? Um, that's a tricky question um, because there's no hard and fast rule. There are advantages to doing it in either. Um, part of the reason we have those six core projects in Tempest is because Tempest is a self-contained test suite that can run against any cloud. And there are actually really strong advantages to that because it's black box only and it lets anyone validate any cloud anywhere. Functional tests don't give you that advantage, but they give you the advantage of being able to do more than black box. You can do some you know, gray box or white box testing where you probe the internals. It also allows you to evolve things rap more rapidly at the same time you're adding features or fixing bugs in a project. Um, and you have to weigh you know, the weight of being in Tempest. It's a little bit more heavyweight because it runs against all of the projects. And then there's also you know, implications for people who run outside of the gate. They run it against their own clouds. Um, you have to weigh that against um, how efficiently you can do it in tree and the advantages there. And some duplication is actually OK. It's actually expected uh, for very important APIs and things like that. Does that answer your question? I know, it, I know it's a bit you know, nebulous and not exactly clear, but. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, there any other questions? I don't know. How much uh, time do we have left? Ten minutes? Okay, well, quite fast. Um, uh, another question over here. RefStack. RefStack. Where does RefStack integration fit with the plugin as far as the um, I have, I don't think there's a session on it, or I don't know if there's a session on it. Um, RefStack, for those who don't know, is a wrapper around Tempest to run tests for DEF or interop and trademark. Um, um, I don't. I have my personal opinion on it, which is part of the reason we have those six core projects in Tempest is because, partly because of Def Core. We want you know everything to be in one repo. We don't want people to install and have to worry about plugins and configure it. I totally agree with um, there's a lot of political pushback because Def Core is a very political thing, you know. Um, <laughs> And a lot of projects, I won't name any names, want to control their own tests. Um, and they want to leverage plugins. I'm opposed to that because there's value in keeping it separate, value in you know, keeping it self-contained, and keeping it simple for users. Because it's complicated enough to run anything against a cloud, not just Tempest. And um, so that's my personal view. I don't know what the RefStack team wants to do. I don't know what the DEF core, because RefStack's decision will be influenced by the DEF core committee. And the DEF core committee will do whatever they want, regardless of what I say. So I, totally I think the conversation needs to happen. So maybe it's not for now, but. Well, it's definitely not in this session. But um, I've expressed my opinion quite vocally about this. They don't like listening to me because of how vocal I am. <laughs> I support the position. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the reason you know, I said six for now um, is because that definition of what we consider core will change over time. It might shrink, it might grow, I, I don't know, but it's not set in stone. That's, that's part of why. So we want to be able to support the DEF core use case and other external, and you know, opinions change over time. Um, are there any other questions? Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'll be, um, I guess I'll stand here for 10 minutes. Uh, we don't have to put it on video. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, I don't want to subject that. Oh, there's, are you going to post these slides? Oh, the slides are already posted. Yeah. Um, I have a link. It's a big image. Um, I have a link right there on the bottom. They're, they're on my GitHub. They're uh, LaTeX for people who like LaTeX, but there's also a PDF package, so you don't have to install Tech Live and learn how to compile LaTeX projects. I probably should have included a make file, but I can fix that. Can you make a comment on that uh, the test cases? Um, in Tempest, uh, it's not designed to be unique. It's designed to be idempotent. That's why it's called idempotent ID. 
It's designed to track things across renames. It's not designed to provide uniqueness. Uniqueness is guaranteed by the test runner already. The test names are always unique. The UUID on top is added for um, ensuring that the test is recognizable if we move a file or rename a test. So what's your suggestion to those projects, you know, uh, because you tend to have for your company? Um, well, if you want to be included as part of the Tempest suite, um, which is, you know, very strictly black box API testing, external cloud. It assumes there's a cloud deployed somewhere with your service and you hit it with API requests. Um, you want, if you want to be your functional tests in tree to be included in that, you use a plugin. If they're lower level or something different and they don't, you know, the assumptions they make about the environment are different or you don't see the value in being included in the wider Tempest test ecosystem, then there's no reason to add the plugin. It's, it's there for projects that want to consume it, but there's no, you know, yeah. Which is, the, you know, the whole point about doing the plugin decomposition to enable projects to succeed with the tools we use upstream, but they don't have to, if they don't want to. Um, are there any other questions? Daryl. Uh, <laughs> I hope this is a stupid question, but it, it popped into my head. So, um, from, what I, from what I've read, it looks like the Tempest plugin tests come in as packages, so everything just appears to be part of Tempest. Is it possible to run tests from a plugin at the same time you're running tests from, say, something core? Like, say, if you wanted to run the core set of Nova tests plus an extended set that were coming from plugin. Yes, yeah. and that's actually exactly how it works. Um, the way we use Steve Door um, is it will, when you, you install your Python package, you add an entry point to your setup config if you're using PBR or if you're not using PBR, you have to write a lot of setup tools code in your setup PY to add an entry point with the Tempest test plugin namespace. And that will be loaded when Tempest does test discovery um, or the test runner does test discovery on Tempest. There's a load test hook which will look at all of the, all of the entry points and find all of the Tempest plugin entry points. And then those, that will call load tests, that load test method to return where the tests are and how to, how to call them. And then when Tempest is executed, the test runner will treat all of those external tests as if they were in tree. Right. So you can have as many plugins installed as you want and they'll all be run in parallel if you're running in parallel. They'll be run serially if you run serially. And be because your plugin may include a, a client for your own service. So you can install multiple clients and you can even build scenario tests, if you will, which will rely on multiple services. So if you want to, to have a hit test which works with Manila or something else, so you can do that. Yeah, and that's the advantage of using Python packages is that we have the requirements file, which, you know, as messed up as Python packaging is, dependency handling, you can at least declare dependencies between plugins to, you know, stack them. Um, are there any other questions? No, oh, there's one right there. I don't even know where the mic went. <laughs> yeah, for the uh, Tempest, they uh, generate test, test list and uh, load test list. So is it the same way as the uh, right now it is? Or just like I want to uh, just generate a test list, which include both entry Tempest test case and external test case. And I want to run later with load test with the, uh, the test list that was include both the entry and the external test. Is it still the same way it works it? Work as it? Um, you can work it that way. So the way it will work is um, when you install the Tempest plugins, Tempest, when you do Tempest list tests, it will list all the entry tests and all of the out-of-tree tests. And in your test runner, you can use whatever selection logic you want. Um, you don't have to make two calls if you don't want to, but you can. You can do that to run in tree and out of tree separately, but they'll be treated as if they were all in tree. Is, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Another thing is for the uh, test report, it's the same thing as uh, everything they, they uh, generate in the, in the Tempest dot yeah. log, and then we pass the log and get a HTML report? Uh, yeah, so you yeah. can. Everything, everything will be run as, if, as it is today with Tempest. It will just be loading tests from another repository. Um, so 
for a test results, you'll still have a subunit stream with all of the test IDs and all of the data that's in subunit. You'll have, you know, the output filters we use, the console output will look the same, the logging will be the same, assuming the plugin does logging, um, things like that. It'll, it should all work seamlessly, so it looks like it's part of Tempest. All right, thank you. Well, I feel kind of funny, you know, asking if there are any more questions after every question, but are there any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess if there aren't, we'll end here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.